There we go. So, so when you think of leaf biology, you might think of something like this, which is uh, not a cactus. Uh, just for you, for you succulent people, this is not a cactus. Um, but to starting with leaf biology, if we could take with, start with this cottonwood, uh, this is in fall, and, but there would have been a leaf here, and a leaf here, a leaf here, here. And where a leaf attaches, we have a little bud called an axillary bud. And the buds have, oops, sorry, the buds have scales. Now in cacti, it's those scales that are modified into spines. So in a cactus, we have all cacti, and there are no exceptions, will have at least a little tiny leaf here. Usually they're so microscopic that you can't see them. Um, but in their axle, they'll have this big bud scale, this big bud, and its scales will be the spines that, that make cacti so notorious. Okay? Now, we're really lucky that the cacti, like I mentioned yesterday, that we have this, this genera, this genus of cacti that has not seemed to have evolved very quickly. So it still has a lot of leaves on it. It has big leaves, which you can see here. So this is a, this is Presque grandifolia. It has a, re, it's a real cactus, great big leaves, and beautiful spines, cactus spines. This is an aerial. Um, so I'd like to talk about how the cacti evolved to be the leafless things that we, we think about. Before I do that, there are two questions. I've got a couple of, I taught here at Cal Poly. I had the honor of teaching at Cal Poly for winter quarter here. There are a couple of students in the room, so they should be familiar with these, these questions. These are two questions that are really powerful. You can use them any time in your life. So, so learn these. There'll be a test at the end. So what are the alternatives? Are there, are there more than one way of doing things? And if there are, what are the consequences of each of those alternatives? So I'll try, to, I'll try to ask those questions during this talk. Okay, so starting off with Prescius, and this Prescia diazro marijuana has beautiful leaves. Um, and during the evolution of the cacti, as they became more and more adapted to dry conditions, the leaves became more and more reduced. They couldn't become completely eliminated until the, the stem became photosynthetic. And we can see our stem here. And you say, well, it's green, it can photosynthesize. In a lot of these Pereskias, they, the cacti chose their ancestors really poorly. They, they should have chosen ancestors that had stems that could be really good at photosynthesis, but the cacti didn't do that. Their ancestors have these green stems, but the stems usually don't have the little stomata, the pores that let carbon dioxide in. So these are not good at photosynthesis. Um, so before the leaves could really become reduced and the cacti could become adapted to really dry habitats, they had to have stomata here in these stems. Well, they got that taken care of. And in the group of cacti that we, in the, in the subfamily that we call the, the opuntioids, we get this reduction of, ca of leaves into kind of smaller. They're usually thick, they're pretty succulent. Uh, this is Chiabentia, it's one of the opuntioids. And then Continuing on in this same line of evolution, we get the regular prickly pears, and you're probably all familiar with these having leaves, that all these nice little leaves here, all over the pad. And so this big pad, this ear, is a modified stem. So that's not a leaf, it's a modified stem. It's just a flattened stem. And these are the, the true leaves. They're very small, and notice what the plant is doing. You can tell that this is a new pad. I hope that you all can realize this is not last year's pad. This is brand new. So in the spring, while it's probably mild temperatures and it's been raining or the snow is melting, then this plant has plenty of water. So what it does is it makes these leaves and it has extra photosynthetic capacity. Now in a month or two, when it's later into spring or maybe into early summer, that it's going to be hotter, drier, the plant needs to conserve water, and it doesn't need this extra photosynthetic capacity. These, these leaves will lose water too quickly. What it does is it lets these leaves fall off. So this is, it's, it's got leaves while it has water, and then it throws the leaves away when it needs to save water. Which is a very nice adaptation. Okay, and we find this even in little tiny opuntioids like the Stephrocactus geometricus. We have these tiny little leaves. They probably don't do a whole lot of good, but they do, they do some good. And they're, 
They look purple, but they have green chlorophyll, so these can photosynthesize. In the group of cacti that we call the Cactuidae, the subfamily Cactuidae, which is basically all the cacti that look like cacti other than, other than uh, Opuntias, we often still have visible leaves. So in your Ripsalises, it's very easy to see the leaves. You just look closely, and most Ripsalises don't have spines, so we can get up close and look, and they still have some photosynthetic leaves. Now, these quickly turn brown, like these, these are brown, so they're not going to be, able, they're not alive anymore and can't photosynthesize, but temporarily they can. Okay. Um, even in the bigger cacti, if you look really closely, now I want a so, disclaimer, don't poke your eye out by looking at your cacti <laughs> too closely, so, if you're, so pay attention to what you're doing, but, but very often, below a cluster of, of spines, be, below an aerial, there's a beautiful little leaf. It's a real foliage leaf, so a very tiny. Um, what it does probably, the most important thing that it does, is it creates that little spot where the axillary bud can form and the spines can form. That probably if the, if the stem didn't make that leaf, it could not then make the spines and it couldn't make the, the other, the flower buds and stuff like that. So probably this, this little leaf is only, all it's doing is acting as a placeholder. Now, in the, in the other cacti, in most of these cactoidae, you really can't see that. So you could look as closely as you wanted to in this and with your naked eye and you wouldn't be able to, to see a leaf. But, but there, there is a leaf here. Now, what you could do, if you take a big knife and just cut the top of this thing off and then, then cut off the side and then you cut off more sides and cut off more sides, you just keep trimming and trimming. We want to get to the growing point. Here where the all the new stem is being generated and the new leaves and all the new tissues are being at, at that point. So we want to get rid of all those trichomes, all those hairs and spines and be able to do that. So you cut all that stuff and then you take out your, your handy scanning electron microscope, which I'm sure all of you have at home. And so you use your electron microscope and you look at the, this is the growing point, these are the cells that are generating the whole body. And it's making these little bumps these are the leaves, and they grow a little bit bigger. This is a little bit older leaf. That's the whole leaf, and the whole leaf, and the whole leaf. This is a young spine, and that's all the bigger that the leaves get. So in the evolution of, of most of the cacti, they are getting to a point where the leaves are so tiny. Again, all they do is they make, they make that spot where, where a, a bud can form. Okay. Evolution is an interesting thing. It has, it's just random chance. So mutations happen, the DNA gets damaged or changed, and if that's beneficial, that might, might, not necessarily will, might cause the plants to survive a little bit better or to reproduce a little bit better. Uh, it might not. It may be that it'll give the, the plant uh, uh, really a little bit better capacity to withstand freezes, but that mutation happens in plants that never are subjected to freezes, so that does no good. Um, this evolution of the, uh, of the reduction in the, of the leaves has allowed cacti to minimize their surface area so they don't lose water too much. But on the other hand, it also keeps them from being able to really photosynthesize rapidly if they're having a good year. If, it's, if they really do have a wet spring, or maybe like in, like in this year in, in San Luis Obispo and in, in Texas, it's raining like crazy. So cacti, if they could make leaves, they should make leaves and then, and then really photosynthesize and use this chance. But they've reduced all their leaves. Well, there are, there are alternatives. And what is an alternative to this? So it turns out in flowers in many of the cactus flowers, not all, but look at these scales on the cactus flower. We use the word scale, but that's just, a, that's just kind of a weasel word. These are really leaves. Um, they're, they're foliage leaves. And, and in, the, in the axle, we could find a little axillary bud in, in some flowers. So in flowers that have, have a spiny fruit or a, or a really hairy fruit, then those little axillary buds will be making spines and hairs. So these are, these are regular leaves. Well, if, if this little leaf 
bound down here is so completely reduced that it can't help the plant out, can the plant use these instead? Well, let's see. Oh, well, sure enough, they can. <laughs> so what a surprise. These, if you all are familiar with Opuntias, they, they have these little leaves like we saw on the prickly pear pad. And the, the outer part of a cactus flower is stem. So we're not surprised to find leaves here and leaves here. And up here, this where we kind of expect sepals or transitioning into flowers, we still have very leaf-like forms. So here we have uh, uh, the, the, le the flower itself is able to photosynthesize. Okay. Now, I think some of you have heard one of my previous talks where uh, the odd thing about cactus flowers is that they are inside out and they are inside of a stem. So I need a, I need a visual aid. So normally, if you have a skinny little stem that's growing up here at the tip, then it's, it, the, the apex is making leaf primordia. So the leaf primordium down here was made when the stem was down here. It made this leaf primordium and the stem grows up and it makes a leaf primordium here. It grows up, makes a leaf primordium, makes a leaf primordium. And so it's constantly moving upward, leaving leaves behind it. When it gets to the point of making a flower, then it will say it'll make a petal primordium and then grow up, make a stamen or a bunch of stamen primordia, grow up, and then make the carpal primordium. Well, in a normal plant, by normal I mean a non-cactus, in a normal plant then, what we're going to have is leaf, 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 sepals, petals, stamens, carpels from, from bottom to top. The cacti do that, and this is all happening in a really tiny thing. So if I could press my fingers together tight, we could still put that meristem in between my fingers. It's so small. In what cacti, after they do this, they make the, the petals and the stamens and the carpels, then the center stops growing, but the edges continue to grow. So this thing grows up, and it does this. It just kind of turns inside out and continues growing up. So now we have leaves up here on the edges, petals at the top, stamens down here, and carpels at the bottom. So, so in, this, in this flower, all this tissue here is stem tissue, not flower at all. We get up here and we finally get flower tissue, and then we come back down. So if you're moving from the bottom of the plant to the top of the plant, you go this way. and then into here, okay? No other plants have inside-out flowers, just cacti, okay? So the, the important thing is that we have all this shoot tissue on the outside, and shoots can make these leaves. And like I said, here we have nice big leaves on this opuntia. What about things other than opuntia? Well, here this Econopsis, or I, I prefer the old name Sorensia, um, that's, that's the nice thing about being old. You can, you can just say, I, I don't care about these new names. This is, I learned it as Sorensia. It's Sorensia to me. So this, this Sorensia has beautiful leaves on it. And so it's able to photosynthesize and it gradually transitions into the petals. So here, when this Sorensia is, is happy enough to flower, it's got enough sunlight and water and minerals and everything else, it will make leaves, and the leaves are on the flower, so the leaves make sugar. This is a difference between plants and animals. So when you were growing up, your parent, and, you, and, and, and as adults, you probably told your kids, like your parents told you, you've got to eat your vegetables, eat your fruit, stuff like that, because you need the vitamins and all the amino acids and fatty acids and stuff like that. Not plants. Plants have a metabolism where they make everything from sugar. When any of these green chloroplasts, the little green particles in the cell, when they photosynthesize, the only thing they make is sugar. And the sugar comes out of that chloroplast into the cell, and then the cell can start with that and make everything. It makes nucleotides and proteins and amino acids and fatty acids and vitamins and everything. So, so we measure everything in sugar. So, so these little leaves, they can't make a whole lot of sugar, but they're making some, and the sugar is being made right here on the flower where it's needed. So it's going right there into, into, a, uh, into a, a, a sink, it's something that needs it. So this is a really nice adaptation. Well, these aren't very big leaves, 
But everybody that has cacti has a gymnoclesium, right? So, and you've all known that gymnoclesium are so beautiful because of these big, nice green scales before the flowers open. So here's where we have a cactus that has nice big leaves on its flower. So this can actually do some real photosynthesis, okay? So it's not just like, oh, that's a nice theory. No, these really, these really work. Um, Leuchtenbergia or your ferrocacti, same thing. Nice, big, beautiful photosynthetic scales. And then we get to Pachycereus gaumeri. Can you all see there are real leaves on this flower? So it's not just like, oh, wasn't well, that cute that they get a little bit of scales? No, this thing becomes really leafy. So this, it's the old name is Pterocereus, but now Pachycereus gaumeri. So very leafy flowers. Can y'all see that? You want to see it better? <laughs> How about that? So, so leafless cacti, well, not so much. These cacti, this cactus especially, is really leafy. So that, that, is, that is a lot of photosynthetic surface area, and all that sugar is going right there into the developing flower. And the nice thing is, when the, if the flower is pollinated and it starts developing into a fruit with seeds, those leaves will stay on there and they'll help the fruit develop. Here's a, a shoot of this thing. And so if this didn't have any leaves, if, if the cacti were as leafless as we think of them, then this poor little flower, it would depend on this little bit of shoot for photosynthesis. This flower would depend on this bit of shoot and this bit of shoot. But here instead, this has this whole plethora of leaves. Okay? Now, and now think about the nice aspect of that. When the fruit is mature, it's going to fall off the stem and it's going to take the leaves with it. So now that it's done with all this real heavy, heavy lifting of building a flower and building a fruit and building seeds and it doesn't need to really photosynthesize so much, it throws away those leaves and goes back to being a, a leafless cacti that's well adapted to really dry habitats. So that's a pretty nice adaptation. You can see this for yourself. Probably nobody has ever seen Terocereus gaumeri before, but, but you've all seen dragon fruits. And so the dragon fruits, you can go to the store, and here are the big leaves, very photosynthetic. And this dried up part of the flower, all leaves were leaves as well. So in this dragon fruits, big, big leaves, a lot of, lot of photosynthesis, a very leafy cactus, a very leafy cactus. So, if you're not familiar with centimeters, this flower is about a foot long and it's covered with big leaves. So any, any self-respecting plant would be happy to have leaves that size. Okay? So cacti are leafy plants. Okay, and even little tiny things. We've got leaves here. Um, doesn't always work. Not all plants do this, that, that you know, it's, it's, it's these this pieces of the puzzle that this, for some reason, some of these plants, they, they make the leaves, but they don't have chlorophyll. They just have the pigments. So if you would take this off and look for chlorophyll, it would not be there. So we have this, this potential that's not being used. I just want to throw this slide in and the next one, just to remind you that, that those, those, these little, these little things There's something, that, there's something that really confuses this. Okay, there we go. These little leaves, so even though they're not photosynthetic, they do make, they do have a little axillary bud, and normally an axillary bud on a flower doesn't do anything, but in chain fruit choyas, they do. So like this Opuntia leptocollis, the, they can have a new flower on the old fruit, and that fruit was on an older fruit, and this even happens in Harissia. So Harissia martinii, you can have a big fruit that you would expect was just going to fall off the plant and spread the seeds. Instead, its, its axillary bud develops into a whole new flower and goes as a kind of a chain fruit, choya type thing. Okay. Now, leaves, so that's the reduction of leaves, but we also know that leaves have been modified into spines and cacti. That's, that's no surprise. Um, and here in this, this Macarocereus, we have these big protective leaves, and we have these little 
photosynthetic bud scales on the flower. I don't want to talk about spines because you're all painfully familiar with spines. I want to talk about some modification that, that some cacti have, we don't know how many have. These are extra floral nectaries. So this is a, by extra floral, we mean anything that's not in a flower. So these are, it's a nectary that secretes sugar water. That's all you have to do to be a nectary. And if you're not in the flower, then you're an extra floral nectary. Well, these are the glands, the extra floral nectaries on a ferro cactus. And these are short spines that just don't develop. They are formed like a little spine primordium. And instead of becoming long and pointed and hard, they just stay short. And all the sugar that they would have used to make a big long spine, instead they just take that sugar and mix it with water and dump it out and attract ants, of course. Okay. Um, why? What's, what's going to be what's going to be an advantage of that? Now keep in mind, there's no such thing as purpose in plants. Um, we just have to ask, how does it affect the biology? How is this beneficial? Um, well, spines have, these big defensive spines, have a very deleterious effect. Um, sure, they keep away big herbivores like mammals and birds and things like that, but they don't keep away little tiny insects. And in fact, if a little tiny insect can get underneath the spines, which is easy, then they're protected from birds or things that might eat the insects. So here what these plants have done is they have these extra floral nectaries that secrete sugar, that attract ants, and then the ants will just swarm all of these plants looking for sugar, and if they come across other insects, they chase them away, or they eat them, or they throw them off, or they kill them, or whatever. So, so in this cactus, we have the big spines that keep away big animals, and then the extra floral nectaries that attract ants that get rid of the little animals. So it's, the spines have two roles that really keep these things protected. Um, this is what they look like if you're using your scanning electron microscope again. Um, this is hard to understand, but these, these odd things, these are cells, and they're long fiber cells, and in a normal spine, they'd be packed solid together, and they'd be hard, 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 and that's what makes this, the spine so, so pointy. Um, in these modified nectaries, they, there's a space between all the spines. So there's enough space that these cells can, can secrete the sugar and the water, and then the sugar and water, just the pressure just moves them up. And the, top of the, the top of this spine has broken off. This is it. In the, one in the background that's a little bit younger and the top is still uh, continuous. But once the sugar water builds up under that, it'll rip that off. And now this big drop of nectar can come here and be exuded and the ants can get it. Okay? So it's, it's pretty obviously a spine. Okay, here we have this in Echinocactus grusonii. This is something that you all can check for yourselves. Um, everybody's seen a million Echinocactus grusonii. Um, about half a million of those will have these and the other half won't. So I've looked at a bunch. I thought, well, I've got some in my greenhouse. Let me take a look. And sure enough, there's a beautiful little nectary right there. A uh, beautiful little nectary right there. But I've looked at other plants and I can't see them at all. So, um, so I'm not sure how common they are in this, in this uh, genus. In the choyas, beautiful nectar drops. And these are where we'd expect to find glockids. And so I thank Jeff for Jeff Pavlet, our new president of CSSA, or he cultivated this and, and let me photograph it. So here we, it looks like we have glockids, not full spines that are secreting. But we need to, need to look at that more to see if that's really true. Um, in this, in this uh, tephrocactus that, that Bob Barth cultivated, we have these beautiful little drops of nectar on the, on the aerials. When I saw that, I thought, that's crazy. I've got this cactus. I've never seen it. So I went back to my collection and started being really careful to not just water like, like a crazy person, just spraying water all over, and just only water this only at the very, at the soil level and not get any water on the plant. And pretty soon, there's nectar. I'd just been washing it away all these years. So this... This thing that probably a bunch of you have secretes nectar, and you may not have ever seen it. Another thing that, uh, so after I saw that, I thought, okay, 
And let's be really careful with all my cacti, just this careful watering. And in this harissia, we have ordinary spines, but do you see this? We have little drops of sugar water that, the, that these ordinary looking spines are secreting. And this is all over them, and, and all my plants have this. So um, not always, and sometimes of the year we don't see it, and it seems to be only when the spines are young, but even ordinary spines. Now, I have to be careful. I've looked at a bunch of other cacti that, okay, while the spines are young, while they're still growing, do they do this also? And I have not seen it. So how common this is, I don't know. So, so um, it's an appeal to y'all is that go home and make sure you don't have any ants in your greenhouse or any ants around your plants because the ants will harvest it so quickly you'll never see it. But if you keep the ants away and then only water, uh, don't, don't get any water on the plants, just let me know if you start seeing secretion from, from spines. Because uh, this, is, this is something that's brand new. That just, we just, we've known about nectaries in, in cylindrical punches and feral cacti for a long time, but these other ones, this is brand new, brand new observations. Um, this is Calamanthium substerile. I showed this yesterday, this big crazy thing in, in, uh, in Peru. Um, this is the champion secretor. This, these big things are blobs of sugar. Real blobs of sugar. Now, how do you study this? Well, you can a lot of, lot of patience. Um, but look, we have this, this is separate from this. So there must be a gland under here, a gland under here, another gland, so one, two, three, four, five, six at least. And then on this round gland has a little blob coming out of it, another blob coming out of it. So my guess is that the gland secreted a bunch and then stopped. And so it kind of, it water evaporated and it crystallized and hardened. And then the gland started secreting again. So it pushed out a little bleb from the side. So that makes me think that it's, a, it's an episodic secretion. But we don't know. This is, this, is, this is part of that puzzle, but some of the parts are missing. We haven't made the observation to even have the part to stick it in the puzzle yet, okay? Um, since this is water, since this is a, a sugar solution, all we have to do is do a little bit of warm water on a Kleenex, and we can just wash that away. And then we just wait 24 hours and, and they start secreting again. And this is a piece that I'd cut off from the plant and brought it in my laboratory so I could watch, watch it in air-conditioned comfort. And even, even cut off from the plant, it still continues to secrete. So uh, um, this would be wonderful to study. And I, I gave a bunch of these to the Huntington Botanical Garden and to, and to the Desert Botanical Garden. So this plant should be um, available um, before long. Like it's a big, ungainly, ungainly, gangly plant, but scientifically, it's, it's a really cool thing. The best place to see extra floral nectaries is on the flowers. You might think, well, if it's on the flower, it's, it's a floral nectary. Well, remember, the outside of the flower is a shoot in an awful lot of cacti. We see these big drops of nectar on the outside of the flower. If the nectar were inside, way down here by the ovary, it would be a floral nectary. But here on the outside, um, sorry, and these seem to be not coming from the spines, but from the leaf. So where the leaf would be, or just below the leaf. And here, this Acanthocereus, we have nectar here, 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 and it's coming from the, from the leaves, not from the spines. Armatocereus, this I mentioned this again yesterday, Armatocereus is this, one of my favorite cacti that that it grows in these episodes, these jointed things. Um, but also what it does is at the top, uh, at the top, we'll see these blobs of nectar come out and, and crystallize. And this is, again, not coming from the spines. It looks like it must be coming from the leaf. Now here, there's one big blob, and there's one here and one here. So is that like the, the, the gland secreted? And then, and then little bits and pieces rolled away or dripped down the side? Or, or there, are there three nectaries there? I don't, I don't know for sure. Um, here in this one, again, our main blob where the leaf would be, and then a blob here and a blob here, could have rolled down, secreted here, and then just rolled down. We have this big discoloration. And so that makes me think that there's a whole big patch under there 
that has a different anatomy that maybe this whole region is secretory. Um, but I don't know. I had one plant that was growing perfectly upright because um, I'm a really good cactus grower. Ha, ha, ha. Um, but it was growing perfectly upright and it was, it, was, it was nice and secreting at the very top. So we have this one here and this drop here. Obviously, this drop could not have rolled away from that one. So this, this one did not dr drip down from this one. So this makes me think we have two nectaries here. And two here, two here, several here. So this is a whole biology that needs to be examined. I'm old. I'm not going to get around to it. So anybody out here that, that wants to, needs a project, is uh, all these extra floral nectaries are just amazing things. In, you don't need a, an exotic thing from, from Peru. Here at Lophosarius shadii, we have these things. You have these little drops. Now, a leaf, the little leaf close to this, should be right here. But this is way down here, like, what on earth? Um, if you look carefully, this, now this ant, so we don't see nectar on this. There's no nectar anywhere because this ant has gotten it all. But we have a bump here and a bump there. Those bumps might be the foliage leaves, but I think probably not. I think probably the foliage leaves are here, and this is something else. But, but that needs to be studied. So um, a project to, to, for somebody else. Another aspect of leaf biology in leafless cacti is, so you've gone through all this evolution and you've, have you reduced your leaves, and so now you're really adapted to nice dry habitats, and then for some reason, you now are becoming adapted to wet habitat. You're now going to live in a rainforest, um, like these epiphyllums or, or things like that. Well, can you get your leaf back? Very often not. Because in, in the reduction of those leaves, you probably have lost all the genes that are necessary. But cacti are ribbed, and if you just reduce your ribs to having only two ribs and make those two ribs really big, you come back to being a leaf-like structure again. And that's what these epiphyllums and other things like that do. So this is a stem, and the true leaves is there and there and there. So this is just a two-ribbed flat stem. Um, that's acting like a leaf. Well, if it's acting like a leaf, it should have a bunch of veins throughout, like leaf veins. You hold a leaf up to the light and you can see all those veins. Does this do that? Um, well, let's take a look at this Salinocerius anthonianus. Um, it's also two-ribbed. The ribs aren't continuous. They do these crazy things. So who knows why? Uh, the true leaf would be there and there. But if we could look into that, and as you might guess, I have a way to do that. We can clear the leaf. By clearing it, you just soak it in sodium hydroxide, a strong sodium hydroxide solution, and that will make it transparent. Um, and then you put on a stain, and we can see all these veins. So the red is staining the, the water conducting tissues, the xylem. And we can see this has a whole lot of, of xylem through it everywhere. It looks like a, it doesn't really look like a leaf vein. If you looked at that, Looked at that, uh, show that to a botanist, they would not say, oh, that looks like leaf venation. They'd say, what's that? There's no midrib and all that stuff. But we've got, we have, we're conducting water through this whole thing. Um, this is kind of a, not a very good slide. And I show you, I'm showing it to you just so that you like this next slide a little bit better. So, so there's a lot of venation in this thing. So this stem is acting like a leaf. It's got a big surface area. It's got a lot of stomata. It can bring in CO2. It can carry out photosynthesis. It can, all these veins can bring water out and keep this thing nice and hydrated. And everywhere we have xylem, we're going to have phloem. The phloem can collect that sugar and bring that sugar back into the stem and take it away. Okay? So, so in the opposite direction of losing your leaves, some of these cacti have gone in the opposite way and regained leaf-like structure. Um, well, a little bit of leaves is a little bit of leaf-like structure, but not very much. If you look at like an ordinary leaf, like any, any old plant can make, um, you have all these veins that run through it. And you can imagine this vein here, this part of this vein has to have enough conducting capacity 
to carry all the water, uh, excuse me, all the water necessary for this whole segment. Down here, this vein only has to have enough water conducting capacity for this whole segment. Down here, this vein only has to have enough capacity for this little segment. So we'd expect veins to get smaller and smaller and smaller as they go away from the, from the, from the petiole. Um, and in cacti, especially the prescus, the really leafy cacti, real honest to goodness leaves, they do the same thing. So, so some of the veins are pretty good size. They're several cells wide. Um, so this is all xylem cells, conducting cells. But then when they branch off, they're skinnier and get skinny and then branch off to be really skinny. Here's a little bit thicker and get skinnier. But the odd thing is at the very end, so you might think, well, at the very end, they should be the skinniest of all. They're just, they don't have to connect any farther. We're, we're done. That just, that comes down to be the, the skinniest of all. But very often, in, well, in the Prescius, all always, but in a bunch of other plants too, they're really fat. This, is, this end that should be skinny is really wide. And so is this and this. When, they, when a vein does that, we say it has terminal tracheids. So it's at the terminus, and these cells are called tracheids. So these are terminal tracheids. We don't know what they do. They, some people say, well, they store water. Well, why do you need to store water in a leaf? That's kind of crazy. And why do you store water at the end of a leaf where you have the less, least conductivity? So we just don't know what they do um, in any plant, not, not just cacti. We don't know them in, in any other plants. If we look at these leaf-like stems of, of epiphyllum and things like that, the, the veins are small. This is hard to judge since I don't have anything for you to compare it to, but they're small with narrow cells. These are the water conducting cells here, and these are the sugar conducting cells. But they're small like you'd expect. But then when we get out to the end of the vein, they all of a sudden become big and fat many, many, many cells wide, many, many cells thick. So this vein has much more conducting capacity than the vein that feeds it. So this is a set of terminal tracheids. Why they are there, I have no idea. Um, if we go back, notice that all of these cells are round. So that they're round because these are long tubular cells that are cut in cross-section. So a whole bunch of, you cut, you break a bunch of spaghetti in half, you just get little circular cross sections. In this set of terminal tracheids, we have a whole bunch of end walls, like here, all through these. So these, are, these cells, all through here, are not long and conductive, they're just short and fat and, and they're not moving water. So, um, so this is a mystery. So we don't know what they do in leaves, but the odd thing is stems that have evolved to act like leaves have evolved to have this mysterious thing that we don't know what it does. So, um, and then we have something like this in Escobaria. Um, we have an ordinary skinny little stem and then we have these three big three fat cells. Like, what are those doing that all of a sudden you have these big high conducting capacity cells out here at the end? So, um, lots, of, lots of unanswered mysteries. Um, well, this slide, since we're talking about the leaf biology of leafless cacti, I figured I would show you a cactus that really is pretty close to leafless. So this will have, it'll have its little tiny, tiny foliage leaves here, microscopic. We won't have any spines, so those, those axillary bud spines, leaves, they're not there. If, if you look at the flower, when it's open, it doesn't have any little photosynthetic scales on the, on the sides of it. There's just nothing. So this is a good example of a, a cactus that is very, very close to leafless. Okay? So, um, so this could have been my one and only slide, and it really would have been a nice short presentation. <laughs> so, um, so I'd like to just uh, close by saying there is a huge amount of work that still needs to be done on, on cacti. It's a big family. It's dominant in so many parts of, of the United States and Mexico and Central America and South America. You know, like 1,850 species. Um, but so many of them have had almost no work on them done other than to argue about the names. So there's a lot of ecology that needs to be done, a lot of plant anatomy that needs to be done, a lot of physiology. So, so um, 
so very often for, for young people especially, and for older folks like us, that it's easy to think, oh, everything's been done, everything is known, all the, there's somebody out there that knows it all, but that's not true. There's just a huge amount of, of work that needs to be done. <clears throat> and I'd like to also thank the CSSA Research Foundation, Research Funds, because they have given me, they've been very generous to me to, to sponsor me on some of my trips to South America, and they also um, fund other researchers, and, and especially they like to fund young students. Um, so everybody that, that bought plants that night, last night and, <clears throat> and helped contribute to that fund, that's, that's very generous of you. It's, it's going to a good cause. So with that, I'd like to say thank you. Any 